All right. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> there we go. That's better. This is a church retreat, people, or family camp if you're old and you just can't make changes in your mind like that. Uh, good to have you all here. Uh, we're going to, um, I think, I'm Lord willing, Milton's on his way here. We just ate dinner with him, and so long as he, oh, he's right there. Okay, good. Praise the Lord. That's good. All right, well, um, find a seat. I know some of you are struggling in the back. There's snacks all over the place and lots of fun stuff uh, to grab. Uh, come on in, find a seat. We're gonna let me ask a few questions. I have some candy to give away first. We're gonna do a little bit of a game here. How many of you are under the age of eight? Raise your hand. How many of you have never been in a family camp before? In a main session, you could have gone to a family camp before, but you just never been to a main session under the age of eight. Not all the high school boys are like, oh me, candy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, come on down, James. Who else? Under the age of eight, never been in a main session. Come down. If you're one of those kids, come all the way to the front. Come on. All right, let's give them a round of applause. Careful, little. Careful, careful. There you go, dude. All right. These guys got these guys got upgraded this year because we're a little short on child care. Uh, they are going to be in the main session. Oh, there's this box, too, if you guys like those. Any of those. Anything you'd like. But you have to do have to choose one. Perfect. Yes, good. Wonderful. You've never been in a main session? No. Oh, okay, go ahead. When your own kid comes up here, you're like, nah. Oh, stop. Careful. Let's unplug this for just one second. That way we don't kill anybody. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so a couple more questions. Um, how many of you, this is your very first ever church retreat with FBC? Very good. Stand. Stand for us. Just stand up. It's good. Very good. Woo! That's great. All right. Can you, can you all hear me? Like, you guys in the back, can you hear? Okay, good. Thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, good. Well, um, we're going to uh, get started here, uh, but there's a few things that we need to do first. There's a few, uh, what, what's the right word, like housekeeping items. Number one, uh, we just want to say a huge thank you before we even start to uh, Louisa Austin. Where's Louisa? <laughs> Woo! Everyone cheer for Louisa. Thank you. Yes. She is... She is the artificial intelligence behind Family Camp. It is remarkable how much she keeps in her brain all at the same time. So we're super thankful for her. Uh, and then also Mike Gillis. Mike, raise your hand. Yes, Mike Gillis. Thank you. <laughs> it's these guys. They hate public recognition. So we do this right out of the gate. That way the pain is over and they're good to go. All right. A couple more questions here. The next question is, how many of you have never received from us this book? How many of you do not recognize this book? If you don't recognize this book and you don't have one, come to the front. You have to be over the age of eight. Come to the front and get a copy of this book. How many of you don't? Yes, come. Oh, perfect. Yeah, you're just helping out. Thank you. <clears throat> I was going to say, I think I personally gave you that. If you lost it, John, very good. There you go, man. Absolutely. Oh, 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 sorry. There you go. Take two. That's good. Uh, anybody else? Oh, yes. Hi. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Hi. So sorry. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I turn around. Anyone else? Yes. Go ahead. Very good. All right. Now, the wonderful thing. Oh, yes. Good. Come on down. Wonderful. Here you go. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So the, the crazy thing about this year's family camp, yes. You need one? He doesn't. Joe, let me see your gospel primer. <coughs> it's a primer. We don't call it a primer. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Milton will call it a primer. And he wrote it. So we should listen to him. I just struggle. I just struggle. I'm weak-minded. I can't go backwards. This is the original gospel primer, right? This is crazy. It's still spiral-bound. So this is like... This is like gold, right? I mean, you just never lose that. That's beautiful. <laughs> Good. If you, yeah, if you have one thing to get, don't get the family photos. Get that uh, when the fire starts. Okay. Um, anyway, we have a very exciting family camp, church retreat, whatever you want to call it. 
Uh, the guy who wrote this book is here, uh, Milton, Milton Vincent. So yes, please give him a round of applause. Uh, it is a running joke with the young adults, at least, that that's really pretty much what I give everyone. Uh, but we don't give that book out for no reason, right? We don't, and we also don't give it out just because we like Milton, though he's a great guy. We give that book out not for Milton's sake and for his <laughs> royalty checks. Uh, he did agree at dinner to give us a small cut of all the future sales, so that's a win. Um, no, we give it out because what's in the gospel primer? What's in there? What's in there is actually this, yes, thank you. It's, the, it's like an adrenaline shot of Christ, right? It's the beauty of who Christ is and his love for us expressed in the gospel, the reality of our sin, the beauty of Christ's death on the cross, and the forgiveness that we have in him all just packed tightly into this one really tight, neat ball. And it, and it is a shot of Christ into our hearts when we need it most. And when do we need it most? Well, every day, right? So that's the beauty of that book, and that's why we give it out. So, again, if you're here and you don't have one, please, please come and see me. We have lots, and we're happy to give them out to you, okay? Okay, so we're going to give a few other books away. All right, so I'm going to ask some questions. If this applies to you, Raise your hand, come forward. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Some book giveaways. Uh, number one, who has the nearest birthday to today? The nearest birthday to today. Who thinks they have the nearest birthday? <laughs> no one was born in October in our church. It's a miracle. Okay, when was yours? 23rd? 14th? 5th. Yes, Andrew. She's the 9th. The third, but that's we're closer with the ninth. Anyone closer than the ninth? Fifth to today. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, fifth. Where was fifth? Allie. Allie, come on down. Andrew, see me after. Very good. Good job. All right. Okay, uh, next one. Let's see here. Who traveled the furthest to be here? Five minutes. Isn't this nice? The location's great. Who traveled the furthest to be here? We're actually doing this just to call them out. <laughs> you guys can stand up. Rick and Mary Ann Smith are here with us. Yes. Super thankful for them. Good to have you guys with us. It's a huge blessing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, next one. Who is the who is here? And this is your this is the newest person to even attend our church. Not a regular attender, but the newest person to attend our church. Yes? In the way back, I am not wearing my glasses. Very good. Well, I trust you. Come forward. That's good. Well, I'm just grabbing them off the top. The, the order and titles of the books are not related at all to... <laughs> Here you go. Yes, thanks for coming. Yeah, Miriam? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, um, who has the most children? Oh, us. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Sorry. Okay, um, who had the most recent baby? The most recent baby? Pursleys. Are they here? Yes, very good. Joe, come on down. <laughs> We're going to give you a copy of Battling Unbelief. <laughs> We've all, many of us have had children. We know it's necessary. That's good. Good. All right. Who's the, who's the next do? The next baby do? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Arthur, don't do that. <laughs> he said the chaws. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> that threw everyone for a huge loop. Okay. <laughs> you just want a book. Okay. They just want a book. That's really all. <laughs> okay, who's due next? Who's the next person due? Kevin and Madison? Yes, come on down, Kevin. Very good. Do you have lectures to my students? Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Good, okay. Uh, this one's a little tricky, a little different. Who most recently got their driver's license? Not, not our kids. Who most recently got their driver's license who's a male? I mean, we can, we, can, we can stretch this out a little bit. 
The male who most recently got their driver's license. Friends. No, permits don't count. Micah Sue, you have your permit? Yes? Come on down. You count. Come on down. Very good. Very good. This is a book called Thoughts for Young Men, and we didn't know how to identify young men any other way. Okay. Good. All right, a couple more. Uh, who has the most pets in the room? Who has the most pets? Some of you are like, absolutely not. I'll never get a book. <laughs> how many of you have? Who has the most pets? Anyone have a guess that they might have the most pets? Huh? Living or dead? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go with living on this one, but that's a great question. Dead could get super weird, so we'll just leave that one alone. Most living pets, come on, no one has any pets? Who? Three? Seriously, three? Who's in the way back? Who, who's back there? I should have put my glasses on. This is so bad. How many do you guys have? Fish count. Aquarium is one. Chris Lee has a really good idea here. An aquarium is one. That's wise, Chris. Thank you. Because otherwise, someone's got guppies, you know, and you have like 274 or something. Yeah. Okay. Some of them are being eaten by other fish as we speak. Okay. All right. So three is the winner. Allie, you're the winner again? Yes. You have seven? I didn't even see your hand. That's so good. Here you go. <laughs> oh, good. She wanted the book. It was a providential thing. Very good. Okay, good. Okay, next one. Um, okay, this one's a little bit trickier. Um, how many of you have never read a Puritan of any kind? You've never read anything by a Puritan, ever. A, what's a Puritan? You just want this book, are there? <laughs> You've never read a Puritan author. This is not a mark of shame. Max, come on down. That's fantastic. Come down. That's great. This is a really good one to start with. This is Richard Sibbs. It's called The Bruised Read, and you will love it. I promise. It's so good. Okay, very good. All right. Um, uh, okay, two more. Uh, who is the newest person at Young Adults Group? Michaela. Michaela, come on down. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Good. There you go. Yep. And then one more. Who, this one's tricky, who has had a, an evangelistic conversation in the past two weeks? Good. Where you've shared the gospel in the past two weeks. James, Paul Yoon. He's in the park. He just had a, he just shared the gospel in the parking lot? Paul, where are you, Paul? He's in the parking lot still. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, come on down. That's awesome. Come on down. Come on down. That's so good. Awesome. Praise the Lord, man. That's so cool. Here's a book. Yes. That's a great book. It's by Jack Miller. So, so helpful. All right. Well, <clears throat> we're going to play a quick game. Okay. So what I need you to do is get out your phones, and you're going to take notes. You're going to give an answer. We're going to play FBC trivia. Okay. Now, for some of you... This is your first family camp. FBC trivia, you're going to be like, I don't know any of these. And that's not intentional. What I want, we want you to do is also learn the history of our church, okay? So it's a double, it, it works on two different levels, okay? And the person who gets the most right answers, the most right answers, we have a gift for you, okay? All right, so here we go. Take notes, have a phone. Anyone not have a phone or a piece of paper or a pen? Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Okay, here we go. Okay, first question. This one we were just discussing at dinner. How many family camps has Milton taught? How many family camps has Milton taught? Now, let me say this. Uh, counting this one. Okay, now, here's the deal. If he taught at all at a family camp, that counts as a family camp that Milton has taught. Yes, Charlie. I mean, Danny, sorry. Yeah, family camps for us. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. How many? <laughs> we did not discuss that. <laughs> We, had, we don't know his preaching schedule. Yes, good question. How many family camps has he taught for FBC? Okay. Second question. <clears throat> okay, this is, this is a hard one. We all know the title of his book. What is the subtitle of his book? 
the subtitle of his book. If you just got a free copy, that would, that would make it, this one really easy for you. But what is the subtitle of his book? <laughs> you were looking? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, I'm just teasing. Taking notes. Good. Okay, number three. Here we go. What is the name of Milton's church? <laughs> Arthur. Arthur's winning this one. That's good. What is the name of Milton's church? Okay, question four. When we first started Faith Bible Church, what were care groups called? What were they called? They had a different name. They weren't called care groups. They were called something odd. And then we switched to care groups. It wasn't odd. It was good. I'm just teasing. If you don't know, you can guess. Okay, next one. How many missionaries has FBC sent out? Not not how many have we supported. How many missionaries have we sent out? Kale, you had a question? Yes. Yeah, total. How many missionaries total has FBC sent out? Yes. Do we count? (laughs) No. How many missionaries have FBC sent out? In the old school, not last week's sermon definition of missionary. Mike Gillis, why are you so rebellious, dude? (laughs) I'm just kidding. Okay, good. Okay, next question. What year was FBC founded? What year was it planted? This one you got to be careful on. There are two dates depending on which co-brother you talk to. We're talking the Joko brother date. Next question. What sermon series did John Coe spend nine years doing? What sermon series did John Coe spend nine years preaching? Nine years. You thought Romans was long. Nine years. Okay, next one. In those early days, not the very earliest days, but the second location, where did FBC meet? The second location that FBC met, which is not the SDA church. (laughs) No, it does not. There were a couple small interim times. Okay, next question. How long was John Coe the pastor of FBC? How long was John the pastor of FBC? No. <laughs> Nine years. It's just one sermon series. Fired him at the end of it. No, I'm just kidding. There was a Puritan who preached on Job for something like 40 years. He preached 700 and something sermons. It's an entire shelf of books if you get it published. I'm not, we're not doing that. Okay, um, what is the name of John Coe's church right now in Maryland? There's a lot of whispering. Okay, next one. Here we go. When, uh, when our family moved back from India, what book of the Bible did we start in? What book did we start in uh, for the preaching of the word, before Romans, the book before Romans. Okay, next question. How many interns has FBC had in its complete history? It's not as many as you think. (laughs) How many of them are are here right now? Good one? Oh, no, 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 goodness sakes. None of that. <laughs> ben, we love you. <laughs> yes, how many of you, how, some of them are here even as we speak. I was not a good one, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, three more questions, we'll be done, okay? What is Joel's church's name? Joel Giesbrecht, big German name, took a church in Canada. What's the name of that church? This is so hard. I, you just have to listen. Pay attention. 
Just kidding. I'm <laughs> totally joking. There's a, I, I, I wouldn't have known these. Actually, Kevin helped me come up with them. Okay, and then uh, next one. You're going to know, you know what this one is, right? The name of Jason's church. What is the name of Jason's church that he's at right now? Jason Park's church. Okay, last one. Matt Cop's church in Malawi, Africa. What is the name of Matt Cop's church in Malawi, Africa? <laughs> you don't know that one, do you? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> here we go. How many family camps has Milton taught? Counting this one. Milton, how many have you taught? Four. Four. No, I said counting this one. I think I said counting this one. Yeah, four counting this one, correct? I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Age is not, is not my friend. So, okay, good. Yes, I think that's correct. Okay, uh, second question. What is the name of his book? The subtitle. Gospel Primer for Christians, and learning to see the glories of God's love. If you got a copy, you got a free one. Okay? Next one. What is the name of Milton's church? Cornerstone. Very good. Very good. Okay, next question. What? Sorry. I just got a text. I can't do two things at once. <laughs> Sorry, I'm old. My brain just shut off. Okay, next one. Uh, what were care groups called at the very beginning of Faith Bible Church? Flocks. Very good for everyone who remembers. Flocks. <laughs> very good. Good, good, good. Next one. How many missionaries has FPC sent out? Four. Why four? Spitalis. Pedals, us, and the bucks, and the cops. Correct. Four. Huh? Well, if you eliminate me, three, we'll give you that point as well. Okay? Next one. Uh, what year did FPC start? 2002 is the right answer. Yes. Well done. Good. Okay. In those... In, in not the earliest days, because everyone knows that we met in Joe's house in those early days, but wh where did the church meet after Joe's house? Oh. Oh. What sermon series did John Coe spend nine years in? A summary of the Gospels. A summary of the Gospels. They're amazing sermons, by the way. Go back and listen to them. They're all on the website. You can listen to all of them. Uh, where did we meet the second location? Stony Brook. Good. Good. How long was John Coe the pastor of Faith Bible? Fifteen is the correct answer. How could we start in 2002 and 15 years later, John leaves in 2018? Because for the first year, who was the pastor, Joe? Pastor Sony. You probably have heard that story. So if you haven't talked to Joe, he'd love to tell it. It's awesome. Okay, good. Uh, what is the name of John Coe's church in Maryland right now? Grace Life Bible Church. You need all that. If you just said Grace Life, no point. Grace Life Bible Church. You knew what you meant? Well, then you should have written it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes. Uh, no, we're not going to be that technical. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, what was the book that we first went through when our family moved back from India? First Timothy. Very good, if you got that. That's great. How many interns in the history of FPC? It's more than you might think. Ten. Ten is the right answer. If you want to know the list of names, I'll give them to you later. We're not doing that now. But there's ten, I promise. Kevin and I went through and counted them. Right, Kevin? Kevin. Nod your head and say yes. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay, Joel's church's name. What's the name of Joel's church? Mission Bible Fellowship. Very good. Very good. If you got that, great. Okay, next one. What is Jason's church's name? Lighthouse Bible Church. 
of Orange County, LBCOC, Lighthouse Bible Church of Orange County. I know. I'm sorry. And then, last but not least, what is Matt Kopp's church's name? International Bible Fellowship. Correct. International Bible Fellowship. All right? So, total up your points, and tell me how many points you have. If you think you did really well, tell me. Raise your hand. Anyone who think they did really well? Who? Who is that in the back? Oh, it's Caleb. Caleb, how many points did you get? Nine. Wow. You guys got nine? Did you work as a team, though? <laughs> Kara's... <laughs> Honesty, dishonesty. <laughs> got three girls, and the ones on the outside are like, yes, and the other one goes, no, and the middle one was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Indian head bob, yeah, <laughs> good. Okay, if you got nine, see me after the session, okay? See me after the session, and I have a gift for you, okay? All right, good. Well, I know we've all come in. It's a busy, busy week, and we've all come in uh, stressed and a little tired, and so what I'm going to do is just make sure uh, we'll, we'll take five minutes if you need to go to the bathroom or anything, do that, and then we'll get started with some prayer, and uh, we'll sing some worship songs, okay? So feel free, take five minutes, get some coffee, whatever it is you need to do, and then we'll come back together, and we'll get started, okay? So 7.35, we need to we'll get started. <laughs> Lots of people are gone. <laughs> like, that was the lamest game ever. They're fellowshipping outside. Nathan, will you go make sure everyone outside knows to come inside for me? Thank you. Oh. Oh, it's okay. We'll wait two more minutes. Sorry, I got you all to be totally silent. And now we're going to wait two more minutes and let everyone come in. I guess there's a line for the snack, so... What do you call a bagel that flies? A plain bagel. <laughs> if any of you want to talk to him afterwards and rebuke him, feel free. All right, well, let me pray and we'll get started, okay? Um, if everyone could just stand with me, we're going to worship, go right into worship here. So if you could just stand and we'll pray together and open family camp. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we Lord, come to you tonight uh, and just confess that we are your children. Lord, we are weak and helpless. Lord, we are desperately needy all the time. And Lord, it's so easy for us to think of ourselves as strong and, um, Lord, be self-sufficient, even though we, we're not. And so, Lord, we uh, come uh, to this church retreat, to this family camp, Lord, needy. Lord, we need your help. Lord, we know that you are kind and compassionate and gracious. You're slow to anger. You abound in steadfast love. So, Lord, we know that your heart for us is to help us. Lord, you want us to grow and to change and to be encouraged and to be helped into greater levels of Christ-likeness. And so, Lord, that is our prayer for this weekend. Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. Lord, the blessing that it is to get to be here and to sit under the teaching of your word, to worship, to sing together, to rejoice, to fellowship as a body, as a family. So, Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you. And, Lord, even as uh, Lord, we ask you to bless this time, Lord, we trust that that is your desire for us, Lord, that you're not stingy in the gifts that you give, Lord, that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, and, Lord, there is no variation with you. And so, Lord, we just uh, ask you now, Lord, as your children, to bless us uh, this weekend. Lord, use all the means of grace that are available to us, Lord, to fill our hearts with a greater, clearer, more helpful vision of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, and help us, Lord, help us to believe the truths of your word. Lord, we know that we must believe. There has to be faith. And so, Lord, pray that you would birth that in our hearts again afresh, Lord, that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. And Lord, that we would leave here rooted and grounded in his love for us. And Lord, that we would comprehend, Lord, you and understand who you are. Lord, a thing that is beyond knowledge. Lord, none of these things can be accomplished by us in our own 
wisdom and our own mental acuity. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would do this work in us, Lord, that you would do it for your glory. And Lord, we pray these things trusting, Lord, that as we said, this is your will for us, for our church, for each one of us who knows you to grow in these things. And so, Lord, we pray this trusting that you will work, Lord, that you will bless us as your people. We pray these things in Christ's most precious name and for his glory. Amen. Sing together. This is a day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun, whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good. This is the day you made. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know the truth remains. This is the day you made. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift His name. This is the day. That the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now I can walk in faith. Oh, now I can walk in faith. And you will protect my way. Your every work is good. And this is the day you made. You are the one who saves. I am redeemed by love. And this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift His name. This is the day that the Lord has
Well, it's so good to see all of you this evening. Welcome to family camp, family retreat, church retreat, all of the above. But it's so good to see you. Um, we are so excited to be here, to be together as a church family, and just to be taught under the word of God. And we're just thankful for Milton to be with us this weekend. So as we begin our worship this morning, if you have your Bibles, if you could stand with me and turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'll be reading verses 1 through 10. The word of God says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else 
has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, flesh, I far more, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this evening. Lord, as we pause and think of you we are so grateful to be called your children lord what a privilege it is for us to be your called your sons and daughters sons and daughters of the creator of this universe lord it's amazing to think that you chose us before the foundation of this earth and you opened our eyes to see the glories of christ Lord, we know that our salvation has nothing to do with us Lord, there is no righteous deed that we have performed, nothing good in us that can merit this salvation that you have bestowed upon us by your grace through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you for saving us by your grace, that it was nothing that we can do to earn your favor, but it is surely by your mercy and the love that you have given to us through Christ. And Lord, tonight as we start our family retreat, Lord, I just pray that our eyes would be fixed on Christ and just remember the sacrifice that he made on our behalf by dying on a cross and dying and taking the penalty for each and every one of our sins. And not only have you forgiven us, Lord, you have given us and credited to us the perfect righteousness of Christ. And so, Lord, we come this evening wanting to lift our voices to exalt your son, Jesus Christ, for who he is and what he's done on the cross for us. So, Lord, I just pray that you would prepare our hearts for this weekend for the receiving of your word. And, Lord, I just pray that your word would help us to see your son more clearly. Lord, it would deepen our love and our affections for our Savior. And, Lord, I just thank you for bringing your servant Milton to us this weekend, Lord. I just thank you for him, and Lord, I just thank you for just his ministry to his church, the way that he's going to minister to us this weekend through your word. And Lord, so I just pray that you would bless him, Lord, that you would empower him with your spirit, that he would preach with boldness and the confidence of preaching the truth. And Lord, I just pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, that we would be teachable, that our hearts would be ready and eager to receive your word with gladness. And Lord, we desire to just as a result of you, uh, of us hearing your word, for us applying your word, let, that, Lord, you would grow us in the likeness of your son. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for this weekend. We thank you for the teaching. We thank you for the fellowship that we will have, Lord. And I just pray that throughout this weekend, Lord, our love for you would deepen, Lord, that you would give us wonderful times of fellowship where we could demonstrate our love to one another as well. So thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You, my God, save my soul. I am yours forevermore. Oh, I won't be moved. Of this I'm sure. You're my God. You save my soul.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do want to do that. Lord, we just want to praise you. We do praise you, Lord, because of what you've done for us. And Lord, we do acknowledge, Lord, the, the glory of what we've just sung. Lord, that Christ has defeated every sin. Every sin, past, present, and future, for each one who knows him, Lord, paid in full, every sin defeated. Lord, we are truly forgiven and embraced by you. And Lord, that is the power that cancels, that, that, is, that breaks canceled sin, Lord, that, we, that changes us, Lord, so that we're more like your son. And so, Lord, we do praise you. Lord, we sing hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your son. Lord, we just pray again that you would honor him, uh, Lord, in what we do this weekend, Lord, in our hearts, Lord, as we trust in the truth of what Christ has done for us. Lord, we thank you for him. In his precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, uh, I get to introduce Milton to you uh, briefly. Uh, Milton is the pastor of Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Church. No? Fellowship Bible Church? I'm an idiot. I'm so sorry. Uh, he uh, published the Gospel Primer, uh, which is a, a book that has impacted, I know, many of us. Uh, he and his wife Donna were married in 1987. They have four kids, right? And two are married? Two are married. So two of his kids are married. And uh, uh, his wife did come down with COVID at the beginning of this week, and so she couldn't be here with us this weekend, uh, but they were careful, and so we miss her, uh, but uh, thankful that you were able to come, so it's a blessing uh, to have you with us. Uh, he did graduate from Bob Jones, uh, got his bachelor's there, and his MDiv from the Master's Seminary, where uh, several of us have also gone, and uh, he is serving now as the pastor of his church, and so... Um, Super thankful to have him here. Just as a personal note, uh, when someone first gave me the gospel primer, it was that spiral-bound version. And honest confession, I didn't like it. I read it, and I was like, it seems so simple. And then the more I thought about it, and the more I read it, I was like, oh, it's not simple at all. I'm an idiot. <laughs> and this is incredibly profound. And the more that I read it, and the more that I digest it, the more it began to do its work in me, which, again, is not Milton. It's the Word of God working inside of us and the glories of the love of Christ. And so uh, I have personally benefited from your ministry. And I was also telling him I've been listening to his sermon series on the book of John when I run. Uh, and so when I go for a run, throw in the headphones, turn on a sermon... And the other day, it was he's preaching uh, about the woman at the well, and it was beautiful, and I was crying as I was running, ran past a guy, and he was like, <laughs> but it was so encouraging, and so uh, just really blessed uh, by his ministry, not only through the book, but also just your preaching ministry. So we're thankful to Christ for you, brother, and uh, we're excited to be blessed by that again. So come up and uh, teach the word to us. Let's welcome him. Well, thank you, John, for that introduction, and it's so good to be with you all, um, and I have been praying and asking God to help me to uh, serve you well uh, during our time together uh, this weekend, and it has been, this makes four times that uh, I will have been, at least made an appearance at uh, one of your family camps, uh, but there was a fifth occasion that was not a family camp, but it was your 10-year anniversary. Remember that? And uh, I was blessed to um, uh, be, uh, I guess, deliver the message uh, for that Sunday. And that was a wonderful privilege uh, for me and my wife to be there and to be able to deliver uh, that, uh, that message on that special day. So that would have been in 2012, uh, I believe. And I do remember on that Sunday, they uh, made a really special presentation to... Uh, Pastor uh, John, they gave him a T-shirt uh, with my picture on it, and it and it said something like Milton Vincent is my homeboy, <laughs> and um, and then they also gave him a coffee mug that had that same picture of me uh, on the mug 
uh, with the words, Milton Vincent is my homeboy. The, the problem was that the picture of me, well, I guess he's right-handed, uh, whatever, and so as he would go to drink it, like my face is right, <laughs> right where his lips would go. And John, that really bothered him. And before we left that Sunday, he gave me the mug. He said, I want you to have this. I am not putting my lips on your face. <laughs> so I received that, and we, we had it at our house um, for a few years after that. But then in 2018, John asked me to come out to Maryland and speak at their family camp. And I brought the mug with me. <laughs> And in front of his congregation there at Grace Life, I presented him the mug back. And there was no way he could reject it. So he sent me a picture of it. I still don't think he's ever drank anything from it. Uh, but he does have it on display somewhere uh, meaningful. So, so anyway, uh, we were blessed to be there at the anniversary, the 10-year anniversary of uh, your church. And, and now, once again, for the fourth time, uh, here at your family camp. I love your church um, and the vibe that you have as a congregation. Um, you love the Lord. You love God's word. You have a great sense of humor. I love being with you uh, and I'm looking forward to being with you um, uh, this weekend. And as John mentioned, my wife, uh, she wanted to be here, um, but she, um, and she's feeling better. Uh, but tested positive again today, and she just um, did not want, just not sure if she's contagious or not, so decided to stay home. So it's with regrets that uh, she's not with us uh, and not here with you uh, uh, this weekend. Um, is there any uh, extra copy of the notes that, is there a stack of them somewhere? Like, could I have a copy? Just so, like, I know what to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do in the sessions that we have is we're going to be going through uh, Psalm 139 um, in all four sessions. Um, but before we get started, how many of you would say that Psalm 139 is, like, your favorite chapter in the Bible or, like, in the top three? of your favorite chapters in the Bible, just raise your hand. All right, a few of you. Um, it's one of my favorites, and I remember we went on vacation um, from California to Indiana, and while I was on the road, uh, just to occupy my time, I memorized this psalm. And so I have certain scenery, like going through Colorado and what have you, as uh, quoting this psalm to myself. Uh, this is a psalm that is deep, it's profound, and yet it's intensely personal. And I hope that God will meet you where you are uh, in uh, these four messages that we will uh, be putting our focus on this uh, marvelous Psalm 139. And as you see on your notes, and I, I just put the initials of... Uh, this guy, because I didn't want you to not come to the re or reject me before you uh, heard what this is all about. But it's not my custom. You have to know to quote from Howard Stern in my my messages. He's honestly a man of great wickedness who has a lot to answer for to God. But back in 2014, Howard Stern was interviewing Bill Murray, the Hollywood actor. And during that interview, there was a moment of honesty that took place uh, between them. About an hour into the interview, uh, Howard Stern asked Bill Murray this question, and you see this on your notes. He said, is there something that you question in your own life? Like, why haven't I found that great love of my life? Do you ever reflect on that? He asked Bill Murray. Bill Murray paused for a few seconds and and then said, I do think about that. And he went on to say that the reason he hasn't found the great love of his life is because there's something else that he feels like he needs to do first that he's been afraid to do, and that is to work on himself and become more of a person, he said. 
Stern then asked him, so why aren't you taking care of that? And before Bill Murray could answer, Howard Stern said, you're afraid to. That's what stops me. I get afraid. And Bill Murray replied by saying exactly what stops us from looking at ourselves and seeing ourselves is that we're kind of ugly if we really, if we look really hard. We're not who we think we are. We're not as wonderful as we think we are. And when he said that, Howard Stern totally agreed and said to Bill Murray these words. He said, I think you hit it on the head. I think the hardest thing for anyone to do is to confront who you are and work on it. Most of us want to run away from that. That's the way it is. Even though a lot of good stuff would come out of it, it's just too painful. And Bill Murray agreed and said, and I quote, it's not just painful, it's hard. It's difficult because there's parts of us that say, hey, let's not do that right now. Let's just have another donut. Let's just tell each other how wonderful we are. There's some part of you that wants to turn off the demand to see yourself. It's kind of a human dilemma. It's something where there's a flaw that makes it very difficult to look at yourself. And Bill Murray is right. What he describes is the human dilemma on this side of the fall, is it not? And if we're honest, we would have to confess that we are all naturally afraid to see ourselves truly. And I stand before you tonight and confess that I have this fear as well. None of us likes to look at ourselves honestly, but the truth is we will never be truly whole until we do so. And fortunately, God gives us, according to the book of James, the Bible as a mirror to hold up in front of us to help us to look at ourselves and to see ourselves truly. And there's something actually in particular about the Psalms that helps us to be truly honest and to look at ourselves for what we truly are. I don't think this is in your notes, but Timothy Keller in his book on the Psalms says this, the Psalms take us deep into our own hearts 1,000 times faster than we would ever go if left to ourselves. Eugene Peterson, and you do have this in your notes, says, and I quote, the Psalms take me excruciatingly deeper into the core of me. In the Psalms, we not only learn how to look at God and how to behold God, but we also learn how to look at ourselves and how to sit still under the gaze of God as he searches us through and through. And that's exactly what we're going to see happening in Psalm 139 over the length of these sessions. We're going to be spending four sessions together in Psalm 139. And in order to understand Psalm 139, it's probably best that right now that we go to the very end of the psalm and just look quickly at the last two verses. You don't really get, I think, to the heart or the destination of this psalm until the final two verses when David invites God to do six things for him. Listen to what he says to God in verses 23 and 24. He says, "'Search me, O God, and know my heart.'" Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. And I really want to encourage you guys not to skim over these verses and to think that these requests came easily for the psalmist or that they come easily for us. As great as these verses and as great as these requests sound, they represent, honestly, guys, the four things that we all fear the most. 
and you can fill in the blanks in your notes. The first thing that we fear the most is nakedness, nakedness before God, a nakedness that Adam and Eve feared, a nakedness that fig leaves could not even cover, and yet here is David opening himself up completely to the gaze of God. The second thing we fear is being found out in sin, to be found out in sin by God, especially. It's what Adam and Eve feared and why they fled from God when they heard, heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The third thing that we fear uh, most is the loss of control, the loss of control and then giving that control over to somebody else, and namely God. And yet here David is giving control over to God and asking him to be the one who leads. And the fourth thing that we fear uh, is change. Change. Oh, we say we want to be changed. But the main reason we don't change any faster or any more than we often do is because, at the end of the day, we don't really want to change. Let's not kid ourselves. On, on one level, it is at least partially true, but true it is, that all of us are pretty much about as transformed as we really want to be. But in verse 23 and 24... We see these four fears that we've just identified cast aside, and we see David at his most vulnerable before God. Oswald Chambers once said, man is incurably suspicious of God. But in verses 23 and 24, David is a man who seems, at least in this moment, to be cured of his fears and cured of his suspicion of God. And so the question is, when we read these last uh, you know, couple verses of this psalm and look at these requests that David makes, uh, our question ought to be, how does a person get to a place like this, where they would ask such things of God? How did David get to this place of willing nakedness and vulnerability and willingness to be led, giving control over to God and being changed by God? Well, the answer is found in verses 1 through 22. Actually, you can call verses 1 through 22, and you can fill in the blank here, a path to surrender, a path to surrender, to the surrender that we see in the final two verses. In total, there are four main movements in Psalm 139, and uh, you can fill in the blanks here. Uh, number one, David ponders God's loving knowledge of him. He ponders God's loving knowledge of him in verses one through six. Number two, David ponders God's loving presence with him. He ponders God's loving presence with him. Number three, David expresses his passion against those who war against God. And then number four, David surrenders himself with full abandon to God. And we see that in verses 23 and 24. So in this session tonight, we're just going to look at verses one through six as David ponders God's loving knowledge of him. And in the next three sessions, we'll look at the other uh, sections of this psalm as they unfold all the way to the final section of this psalm when David gives expression to his full surrender to God. So here's the deal. If you want to get to the place or if you want God to bring you to the place where you can honestly speak the prayer request of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 to God, then study the preceding verses and see how David got there. And the first thing he does to get there is he ponders God's loving knowledge of him in verses 1 through 6. And what we're going to do, and trust me, we'll be able to get this done because we're going to go quickly. We're going to observe nine truths that David voices to God. Nine truths that David voices to God regarding God's intimate, 
loving, relational knowledge of, of him. Nine truths. And the first thing that he says to God is this, fill in the blank, you have searched me. You have searched me. Look at how this psalm begins. He says, O Lord, you have searched me. Now let's stop right there for just a moment. In the Hebrew text, the Hebrew word Yahweh uh, that we'll pronounce as Jehovah or we'll say Yahweh, uh, the word Yahweh, the name of God, is the very first word in this psalm. So David begins this psalm, first word, out the gate, is the personal name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh, which means that David's whole train of thought in this psalm begins not with himself, nor with his circumstances, but with Jehovah God. We know from later in this psalm that David is dealing with enemies during this Time We know that he's experiencing anxious thoughts as well. There may be even sin in his own heart that needs to be brought into the light. We have indication of that at the end of the psalm. So there's a lot going on in David's life right now. So what does he do? He goes on a lengthy train of thought through the length of this psalm, and that train of thought begins with God, Jehovah. Yahweh. So just the first word of this psalm teaches us something important. Oftentimes when we're anxious or when we find ourselves in the midst of trials or there's sin in our life, our trains of thought often don't include God at all. Or perhaps they may include God, but maybe as a last resort. But Psalm 139 teaches us to start with God and to think about Him as a first resort. If you want to end up in the good place that David ends up in, in verses 23 and 24, then start your trains of thought with God and then reason your way from that starting point. Does that make sense? Let's look at the name Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, It's the, the word Yahweh is in all likelihood from the, uh, the Hebrew word that means to be, or you can fill in the blank that it could be translated, he is, he is. And this being the personal name of God speaks of God as the all-sufficient, self-existent one. He's a God who just is. We require oxygen and we require food to exist, to sustain ourselves, but God's existence is not dependent upon anything or anyone to provide for him or to sustain him. He just is. He always was and he always will be. But the name Yahweh, meaning he is, means even more than this. The name Yahweh serves as the beginning of a sentence that is begging for completion. It's a subject and a verb. He is the subject, is is the verb. It's a subject and a verb that are begging for a predicate noun or a predicate adjective to finish the sentence. In being the great he is, God is the beginning of the sentence that you, if you know him, will spend the rest of your life completing with a variety of nouns and adjectives. And not surprisingly, throughout the Old Testament, we see this happening. We have Yahweh, which means he is, followed by a number of completers. Just fill in the blanks here real quick. Yahweh Sidkenu could be translated as Jehovah is our righteousness or he is our righteousness. Yahweh Mekadishahim could be translated as he is the one who sanctifies you. And so you would write the word sanctifies there in, uh, in, in the blank. Yahweh Roi in Psalm 23.1 means Jehovah is my shepherd Or more literally, he is my shepherd, 
Yahweh Yireh means he is provider. He is provider. Yahweh Shalom means he is what? Peace. Yahweh Rofecha means he is your healer. He is your healer. Yahweh Shama, he is there. And Yahweh Nisi means he is my banner. He is my banner. And there's even more than this. But here's the amazing thing. The people uh, who lived in the land of Canaan and the surrounding areas had hundreds of deities that represented a whole variety of needs. They had a God for every need. Israel, though, had one God who covered all of their needs. Other nationalities and peoples, they had hundreds and thousands of deities to make sure all the bases were covered, and they had a name for each of those deities. Israel had one God with a hundred names. Israel had one amazing God who met all of their needs, and his name is, he is blank. And the people of Israel kept discovering different ways to finish that sentence. And so will you if you walk with God and grow in the knowledge of him. And this all-sufficient, multifaceted Jehovah is the one that David is beginning his train of thought with in this psalm. He says, O Yahweh, O Jehovah, and now look at what he says, you have searched me. The word search means to explore, to examine thoroughly, leading to a particular result, which leads us then to the second expression of truth that David voices to God regarding God's intimate relational knowledge of him and that is number two, speaking to God, he says, you know me. You've searched me, you know me. You have searched me and known me, he says. And actually, you might want to mark this, the word me is not in the Hebrew text. Literally, this passage simply says, you have searched me and you know. You know. There's an element of resignation here. David has been searched out thoroughly by God, and the result is God knows. What is clear from the language here is that God knows all there is to know about David because God has searched him, and God wants to know everything about him, and that's what this psalm is teaching us. Some Theology textbooks will use Psalm 139 to teach the doctrine of the omniscience of God, and you can legit derive that doctrine from this, but there's something more personal than the omniscience of God here. God knows all there is to know about David because he wants to know everything about David, which means this, if you came to God tonight and said, God, why do you know everything about me down to the tiniest detail? Why do you even know the number of hairs on my head? If you ask God those questions, God would not respond by saying, well, because I'm omniscient, I have to know. I have to know everything about you. God wouldn't say that. Instead, he would say, I know everything there is to know about you because I want to know everything about you. I know you utterly because I have searched you through and through and I want to know you. It is this kind of knowledge that David, knowledge of God, um, that David is celebrating this way that God knows him because God wants to know him in this way. David continues with the third truth regarding God's loving knowledge of him. And this brings us to the third expression of truth that he voices to God. Number three, you know all my activities. You know all my activities. He says in verse two, you know when I sit down and, and when I rise up. And these 
two verbs, sitting down and rising up, represent the full sum of all of David's activities. Keep in mind that to sit, to sit in the gate was to conduct business. As a king, it was when David was sitting on his throne that his real business was being conducted. But I'm sure David also, as we do, sat down for rest and relaxation as well. So David is saying, when I sit down for relaxation or to conduct business or to do my job as king, or when I rise up and go about my day-to-day affairs, all of my actions, all of my activities, you know them thoroughly. You see the good things I do when no one else sees, and you see the sins I commit even when no one else sees. And the same is true of you. David takes his thought a little further with his fourth expression of truth regarding God's loving knowledge of him. Number four, he says, you know my thoughts and motives utterly. You know my thoughts and motives utterly. Look again at verse two. He says, you understand my thought from afar. God not only knows all of our actions, but he also knows what we're thinking all the time. The word thought here is the Hebrew word that could be translated with the word purpose, aim, or motive. So this Hebrew word doesn't just speak of a thought that you might think while sitting on your couch. It also speaks of the motivations that drive you to do the things that you do and to speak the words that you speak. So David is saying, Lord, you know my thoughts, and whenever I engage in some action, you know the intentions and the motives of my heart that lie underneath those actions. That's amazing that God would know that. I don't even know all of my motivations that lie behind my actions and my words. And look at this, not only this, but David says, you understand my thought from afar, in other words, God you, don't, God, you don't just know what I'm thinking when I'm thinking the thought, but you know what I'm going to think long before I even think the thought, when my thought is still afar off. And that's amazing. God knows what is going on in our conscious mind, and he knows the conscious and the subconscious motives that drive our actions. He knows our thoughts before those thoughts turn into actions. And guys, he even knows our thoughts before we think those thoughts. That's how well he knows us. And this means that God knows and sees your good thoughts and motives even when others may not see those good thoughts and motives and they're misjudging you. It also means that God knows the sinful motives that might be driving you to do some good thing and others are praising you. But God sees the sinful motives that lie behind your actions. God knows every evil thought you think. He knows the evil thoughts that you have entertained this past week that nobody in this room even knows about. He knows the good thoughts that you think. David continues reflecting on God's loving knowledge of him and gives expression to a fifth truth as he speaks to God. Let's word it this way. You scrutinize. You scrutinize all that has to do with me. You scrutinize all that has to do with me. Look at verse 3. He says, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. The Hebrew word translated scrutinize has the idea of very close inspection. It depicts God as squinting in concentration as he observes us. Specifically, David says that what God is scrutinizing is my path and my lying down. And this expression adds to the body of what David has already been saying. Our path speaks of everywhere we go including our manner of life. It speaks of the direction that we are headed uh, toward. Our lying down refers to our resting and 
sleeping and would even include what a person does sexually. And David is saying that God sees everything with absolute precision, the good and the bad about your path and your lying down. On top of this, David is saying to God, Lord, you, you scrutinize the road that I'm on. You aren't just looking at me, but you also have your eyes on the road that I am traveling on, and you see everything. You see so many things that I can't see. You see what is around that bend up ahead that I can't see yet. You see what is coming up behind me that I cannot see. There's nothing on the road that I'm on that you don't see, Lord. That's an amazing reality about God to rejoice in. We have a man in our church who uh, owns a Tesla, and uh, probably about uh, four years ago, he took me uh, for a ride in his Tesla, and uh, I was just dazzled by it. Um, his car, at least at the time, is probably even more sophisticated now, but his car had eight cameras uh, along with 12 ultrasonic sensors that were beaming out in every direction from the car. The cameras see in every direction from the car, even behind it and to the side, even reading speed limit signs and adjusting the car's speed accordingly. It even had sensors on the steering wheel to know if this guy in our church had both hands on the steering wheel. And if he went more than two minutes without his hands on the steering wheel, he would receive a notification. And he would put his hands on the steering wheel and would silence that notification. I had never seen anything like it in my life. But, but then as I'm as I'm riding in his car and I'm dazzled by all of these amazing features, it, it hit me that I don't need a Tesla uh, for all of that when I'm driving because I already have the benefit of all of those features when my wife is in the car with me. <laughs> I mean, she sees everything in every direction uh, and she will tell me uh, what it is that she sees. And uh, even when she may not verbalize that there's something up ahead um, that I need to break for, I, without her saying a word, I'll see her stiffen up in her passenger seat, and she will press this invisible brake pedal um, in front of her, and I'll know that, okay, it's time for me to start uh, slowing down. Uh, and if my hands are not on the steering wheel, she'll notify me uh, of that as well, only she won't wait two minutes to do that. And she finds parking spots for me because I don't see them and need her to point those out uh, for me. So I have that benefit when I am driving with my wife uh, in the car, but David in this psalm is saying that he has all of this and so much more every moment of his life with God always scrutinizing every detail about everything that has to do with David at all times. God sees everything that has to do with you all the time. He sees what's in front of you and to your right and to your left, he sees what's coming up behind you. And he knows you utterly and entirely. So a question for you, does it help you to know that God is not just gazing at you, but that God is gazing at your path and everything on it with studied concentration? Does that encourage you? Does it comfort you? It does me. Um, I would not have said, I'm 58 years old, I would not have said for probably the first 30 years of my life that I had an anxiety problem. But I'm now at an age where 
I'm realizing I do have an anxiety problem because I used to be able to worry and it not affect me physically, but now I can't, I can't do that. And, and there have been times where uh, bouts of anxiety have really been a challenge for me, but I'll tell you, when there are things that are causing me anxiety, it helps me in those moments to know that God is not only looking at me with studied concentration, but he's also looking upon that thing on my path that I'm anxious about. So sometimes when I am anxious, in my mind's eye, I will look into the face of God and I will observe him not just looking at me, but I will observe him staring at the thing that I am anxious about. And it always comforts me to know that God is scrutinizing those issues and things that I'm anxious about, and it eases my anxiety. This is what David is pondering. God scrutinizes his path and his lying down, but it gets even more intense than this, which leads us to the sixth expression of truth regarding God's loving knowledge of David. Number six, David is saying to God, you are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Verse three, that's what he says. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. And the word that is translated intimately acquainted with means to enter into neighborly and familiar relationship with someone. David is saying, God, you've moved close to me and have become an intimate companion with me in all that I do. Literally, the idea is, God, you have usefully companioned yourself to me in all of my ways. In fact, the Hebrew word translated intimately acquainted with is actually used to speak of what a woman did for King David in becoming his nurse. In 1 Kings chapter 1, we see the word in verse 2 and in verse 4 and how she cared for King David in the final days of his life. Being so old, David was not able to keep himself warm, so she would lie in his bosom to warm him. And beyond that, she served as his nurse. In fact, the Hebrew word there in that passage, the same word that David is using here is translated as nurse in those passages in 1 Kings. So even think of a modern day nurse and how intimately familiar a nurse is with her patient, caring for them and tending to their patient, knowing their condition, recording their vitals, monitoring their condition at all times, and staying close by to tend to their needs. God is all of that and more to us as he usefully companions himself to us in all of our ways, not just in some of our ways, but David is saying in all of my ways, not just in good times, but also in bad times, not just when we're on the mountaintop, but even when we find ourselves walking through the valleys of life, God is there in all of life, in every situation, always. I went through a spell about uh, 20 years ago when I had back problems um, for a stretch of about six months, and um, I, I had sciatica. I could not sleep. For six months, I did not sleep through one night. And uh, for six months, I, I, I didn't sleep for longer than a two-hour stretch at a time. Uh, and I would wake up after two hours with my back having tightened up and feeling like lightning bolts were just shooting down both of my legs. And because of that, uh, I went that six-month stretch without sleeping longer than two hours at a time. And from standpoint, uh, some standpoints, those were six miserable months of my life, primarily because of the sleeplessness. And I'd have to get up every two hours through the night in pain, and then I'd have to just pace the floor downstairs in our house for about 30 minutes until the symptoms would subside and I was able to then go back to bed and sleep for another two hours. 
So miserable days, miserable time. I'm grateful to be past that. But when I look back on those days, guess what? My memories are sweet for this reason. Those 30-minute walks in the wee hours of the night were wonderful times with Christ. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and it was as if Christ was by the side of my bed waiting for me and I would open my eyes with my back hurting, lightning bolts shooting down my legs and I would sense him right there saying, let's go, let's go. And he would walk with me as I paced through the house for 30 minutes before I'd go back to bed and he was a wonderful companion to me during those times. So much so that I found myself when I'd go back to bed, looking forward to waking up two hours later, knowing that he would be standing by the foot of my bed and waiting to walk with me again. So I can testify to you all tonight that I have walked through the valley of sciatica, and Jesus was with me every step of the way. He usefully companioned himself to me as I made that journey, just as I know many of you have experienced or maybe are experiencing even right now in the trials that you're going through. That's the very thing that David is cherishing here, cherishing the fact that God has usefully companioned himself to him in all of his ways in good times and bad, whether he's roaming in the wilderness, running away from King Saul, or sitting on his throne and reigning as king in good times. But David goes even further and gives voice to yet another expression of truth about God's loving knowledge of him. Speaking to God, he basically says, number seven, you know my words even before I speak them. You know my words even before I speak them. He says, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. David is saying, God, you know me so thoroughly that you know every word I ever speak. And not only that, but even before there's a word on my tongue, you already know what it is that I'm going to say. Actually, when you look at this verse in the New American Standard, I think this is the only time in Scripture where we see the expression, know it all. We normally don't like know-it-alls, right? Because a know-it-all is typically someone who acts like they know everything when, in fact, we know they don't. But God truly is the ultimate know-it-all when it comes to us and everything having to do with us. And in this case, the words we speak and even before we speak those words. Putting it all together, we can say that God knows our words before we speak them He knows our words when we speak them. He knows every word that we have spoken throughout the entirety of our lives. He knows every one of the 300 to 800 million words that you will speak throughout your lifetime. And the Bible actually tells us that God will judge us. We will give an account for every single word we have spoken. It's amazing to me that our words matter that much to God. I did some research on this sometime back that the average person speaks um, anywhere from like 300 million to 800 million words in their lifetime. But along with that, I found out that women speak twice as many The average woman speaks twice as many words as the average man. But of course, you ladies know why that is, right? Because you have to repeat yourself (laughs) so often because you're not heard. Can I get an amen? Um, But either way, God knows every word that we speak to others. He knows the tone of those words that we speak to our family members. He even knows the words we speak when we're alone in our car and someone cuts us off on the freeway. So summing up, David is saying, God, you've searched me. You know me. You know all my activities. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You know my thoughts before I even think them. You even know my words before they reach my tongue 
That's an amazing collection of things that David is contemplating here, which leads to a very important question to put before you. If somebody knew you this well, what do you think they would do? Would they love you still? Would they move towards you or would they run away from you in terror? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? For example, if I could somehow magically impart tonight, I could wave a wand and magically impart to somebody in this room that say, Pastor John, I could give to him absolute and total knowledge of you that David in this psalm attributes to God. And if Pastor John ended up knowing you as utterly as is described in this psalm, what do you think he would do and how would he respond the next time he saw you? Would he run away from you? Would he want nothing more to do with you? Would he be disgusted with you? Would he avoid you? That's the fear, isn't it? You see, the thought of being known like this is scary to all of us. This is why Bill Murray and Howard Stern say that they're afraid to look honestly at themselves, but it is this fear that prevents people's love from meaning that much to us. If I'm not known by others, for example, and no one can know us like God does, but we can hide ourselves from each other. And if we do a good job of hiding even from one another, then when people love us, uh, but only know us to a certain extent, their love only means so much to us. We're always left wondering, would they still love me if they knew this? or this, or this about me. As Timothy Keller says in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved, that's our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is what we need more than anything. This is the great need we all have, to be known and loved by the same person but how many are willing to take this risk? We need this more than anything else, and we cannot go out into the world in strength unless this need is met. But where does this need get met? Psalm 139 teaches us that this need gets met in God. And this is where things get really amazing at this point of Psalm 139. David is contemplating how God knows him so utterly, warts and all, sin and all, anxieties and all. And rather than God moving away from him, look at what David says God has done. This is number eight. Basically, he says to God, you move toward me and surround me on every side. You move toward me and surround me on every side. He says, you have enclosed me behind and before. In other words, God, you've moved toward me. You've surrounded me and become my neighbor on every side. With all that you know about me, you didn't move out of my neighborhood. You moved into my neighborhood, as it were. You moved toward me in love. The Hebrew word translated enclosed is from the... Uh, it, it has the idea of besieging a city. In a military context, an army will surround a city in order to conquer that city and bring it to the point of surrender, which is actually what God is ultimately doing with David in this psalm. And that's what David is saying God has done with him. He's saying, God, every direction I looked, you're there. You're in front of me and behind me. I look to my right and see that you've become my neighbor on my right. I look to my left and you've become my neighbor on my left. I look in front of me and behind me and see that you become my neighbor behind me and in front of me also. You know everything there is to know about me. And what do you do? You become my neighbor on every side. And there's one more truth about God's loving knowledge of him that David gives expression to uh, God has not only drawn near to him and become his neighbor on every side, but speaking to God, David says, this is number nine, you've laid your hand upon me. 
you've laid your hand upon me. He says that very thing in verse 5. God has reached out and touched David. In his book, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland says, and I quote, we naturally tend to think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time. Face screwed up, cautiously extending an arm, giving a yelp of disgust upon conduct and instantly withdrawing. But this is not what David is describing at all. David is saying, God, you moved toward me and reached out and laid your hand upon me, and your hand remains. You have touched me with a touch of friendship that says you are mine and you are loved. Evidently, God is not repelled by what he sees in David or in us. We may be, in some ways, lepers whom no one else would ever want to come near to or touch, but God moves toward us, even in our sin, through Christ, and he reaches out and he lays his hand upon us, and now we know that we're completely known and utterly loved by the same person. Well, how should we respond to all these truths? Well, David models what our response should be. He utters three exclamations in verse 6. First of all, he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. When he says knowledge here, he's talking about God's loving relational knowledge of him that he's been describing. David is saying, it's just too wonderful. I don't understand how it is that you could know me so utterly and relate yourself to me the way that you do. David is saying something like what Chris Tomlin says to God in the song, Indescribable. In that song, Chris Tomlin, as you all know, says to God, Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Chris Tomlin expresses many things and he's amazed at by God in this song. God tells every lightning bolt where it should go. He fills heavenly storehouses laden with snow. He imagines the sun and gives source to its light. Those are amazing things. But the final thing that Chris Tomlin is amazed at about God is that he sees the depths of my heart and he loves me the same. And in his mind, that is perhaps the most amazing thing about God. And don't you agree? Looking back at Psalm 139.6, David then says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It, in other words, such knowledge is too high. I cannot attain to it. In other words, I could never attain to such self-knowledge that could match the degree to which you know me. In this omniscient, loving, relational way, I can't even find the words to give expression to how indescribably wonderful it is that you would know me so utterly in this way and love me the same. That's the song that David is singing at this point of this psalm, and it's your song too, if you're a believer in Christ, if you care to sing it. The God that David is describing here is David's God, and it's your God. And everything that David is saying is something that you can say as well. And the truth is, and I'll just say this in closing, that you can say even more than what David says, right? David is blowing fuses in his brain, pondering these things, and he's just an Old Testament saint, With his psalm writing skills, imagine what David would have written if he were sitting at the foot of the cross where you and I get to sit all the time and ponder and worship. Where David would see that these realities of that he's been talking about in verses 1 through 6 of Psalm 139 are on display in their fullest fruition in Jesus at the cross. Think about what God has done for us at the cross. God could have looked upon all of us in our sin and said, I know you utterly, and because of what I know about you, 
I don't want anything to do with you. You are worse than a leper to me. But instead of doing that, the God who knows us utterly did what? He sent his son Jesus into the world to be with us. His name is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. God has usefully companioned himself to us in the person of Jesus. And what did we do to Jesus when he came? To be with us. We killed him. You and I which makes all of us murderers, murderers of God. And Martin Luther once said, don't even try to deny the truth of that. You have the very nails in your pockets. John Stott says, in order for you to, or before you can see the cross as something that is done for you, you must first understand that it was something done by you. And that you and I are complicit in the death of Jesus. But the good that comes out of that is that it is at the cross where you and I committed our worst deed. Which means that at the cross we are stripped bare and exposed for who and what we really are. It is at the cross where we're brought out of hiding and we're forced to face the very thing that we fear the most. And that is to look at the honest truth about ourselves. Yet at the very spot where we committed our worst deed and are exposed at our worst, God moves toward us in love and friendship. He reaches out his hand and lays his hand upon us, and he gives us the gift of his friendship through Jesus and wraps us in his arms and says, I love you. I'm going to forgive you of all of your sins, and I will clothe you with the very righteousness of Jesus. I love what Rebecca Manley Pippert says in her book, Hope Has Its Reasons. She says, in the cross, God demonstrates the deepest law of acceptance. For to be convinced that I have been accepted, I must be convinced that I have been accepted at my worst. This is the greatest gift an intimate relationship can offer. To know that we have been accepted and forgiven and the full knowledge of who we are and even greater knowledge than we have about ourselves. And this is what the cross offers. So there's a lot of precious truth here for you to cherish as a believer, both in this psalm and at the cross. If you are here tonight and you've never believed in Jesus, you've never called upon his name, I invite you to come to the foot of the cross this very night and let yourself be exposed for the sinner you are under the light of the cross and know in that very same moment that you are loved and that God stands ready to forgive you and bring you into relationship with himself and the full knowledge of who you are. And then you will be able to join us in worshiping this indescribable God who knows the depths of our heart and loves us the same. He's an amazing God worth surrendering to. Amen. And he's a God we'll be learning more about in the coming sessions. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for a text like this where we get to witness an Old Testament saint pondering amazing realities that we do well to ponder as well that ultimately help us to know you better and appreciate your great love for us better than we often do. I pray, Lord, that in whatever ways the ministry of your spirit is needed, that you would bring that ministry to the hearts of those in this room that you'd give encouragement where encouragement is needed or even conviction where that is needed. But ultimately, Lord, I just pray that anyone that's here tonight who may not know you or be walking with you, that they would realize, may they so see your beauty that they would consider it an intolerable suffering to live one more day apart from you. And that they would look at your beauty and the greatness of your love, and say, what is not to love about a God like this? 
and that they would run to you, Lord, be captured by your love, and then enjoy these very realities that the psalmist is cherishing in these verses. Keep our hearts open, Lord. We worship you. And help us to understand these things more deeply than we do. I pray that for me and for all my brothers and sisters in this room. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Please stand with us. My Jesus. My Jesus. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you so thankful. Lord, we just rejoice in your incredible, merciful love for us. Lord, you, Lord, you truly do know us. Lord, even what we know of ourselves, Lord, if we Lord, are honest, Lord, our 
hearts are so broken. Lord, we sin in so many ways. Lord, from our motives to our words to our actions, Lord, we have failed you. And yet, Lord, you love us. Lord, you love us because of the righteousness of your Son. Lord, you see those things, and Lord, even though in your holiness, Lord, you have the right to punish us for each one forever. Lord, you've taken all of them off of us. You've placed them on him, and he's borne them once and for all. So, Lord, we just rejoice in this place that we have with you. Lord, that we can rest, Lord, knowing that you love us this way. Lord, we also confess, Lord, it's hard <laughs> It's hard to believe these things. Lord, knowing our own hearts, it's a struggle because we know ourselves. And yet, Lord, they're true. So, Lord, we thank you for your word that teaches us these truths, that tells us about your heart for us. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to believe these things afresh. Lord, to rest in the fact that your hand is upon us. Lord, that you are with us, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. Lord, fill our hearts with peace as we trust these things. Lord, we pray all this in the name of your Son. Amen. We'll take a moment and just have a seat, and then we'll uh, get a few announcements real quickly. Um, first off, uh, they send me announcements because I'm that much of an administrative basket case. I've embraced it. Uh, uh, number one, uh, there will be prayer tomorrow morning before the session starts in the Oak Room at 8.30 a.m. If you don't know where the Oak Room is, you're with me on that because I don't know where the Oak Room is either. Where's the Oak Room? You'll have a map. You have a map, and the Oak Room is labeled on the map. Perfect. Go to the Oak Room if you'd like to go for prayer tomorrow morning at 8.30. Okay, uh, the session does begin at nine, and we're going to start right at nine. So get breakfast, get here. Uh, nine, uh, rock paper scissors will begin at nine o five, and so you know this is a serious thing. Uh, if you've never participated in an FBC rock paper scissors competition, there is bloodshed through the entire process. So just be aware of that; it's very exciting. Uh, so that starts at 9.05. Uh, for lunch, we have a lot of seating under the structures after the service, uh, but you might want to just bring chairs or blankets as well. You can also bring balls or blankets, chairs, drones, and a good arm for a, coal, a cornhole tournament. So all those things. Stretch, be ready, okay? Uh, from now until 11 o'clock, we have fellowship and games in the Pine Room, uh, and, but at 11 o'clock, we do have to be out of the building. So there's still snacks outside. There's all sorts of stuff we can grab, uh, and we can hang out in fellowship. There's games in the Pine Room, and then all of that uh, will end promptly at 11 o'clock. So we just have to be done right at 11 and be out of here so that the staff can leave. Um, don't leave anything behind. Just get going uh, right at 11 o'clock, okay? Uh, last but not least, just pick up your kids quickly so that we can uh, relieve the child care workers. And when you see them, thank them and bless them for serving us uh, by watching the kids this weekend. And then one other request, uh, there are lots of wires and just all sorts of chaos up here. And so if you could do us a favor and make sure your kids don't come up on stage, uh, that'd be a huge blessing uh, for the praise team. They want to make sure everything is intact for tomorrow morning. So uh, just keep an eye on your kids. Make sure they don't come up on stage. All right? All right, well, I hope your hearts are encouraged and blessed. I know mine was. Uh, and so uh, just hope you leave with the joy of the knowledge of God in your hearts and uh, enjoy the time of fellowship together. So thanks, and you're dismissed.